Hello and welcome to To The Point. I am Vishal Dahiya and in less than a few days, uh, the first budget of uh, the second term of the NDA government will be presented by Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman. There has been a consultation process which has been going on for quite some time as to what exactly should be the core areas on which the government will put more thirst this time around. Today, we have with us uh, a special guest and he is none other than the Vice Chairman of Niti Aayog, Mr. Rajiv Kumar. Mr. Kumar, welcome to Rajiv Sabha Television. All of us know that uh, Niti Aayog uh, as a think tank uh, is, uh, you know, uh, is, is basically behind the, the policies uh, formation as well as uh, looking at the larger picture specifically for the government uh, in terms of what it should do in specific core areas, focus areas as well. So today we'll talk about what is to be expected uh, uh, you know, in the first union budget of the second term of Modi government. And let us begin with the uh, macroeconomic picture. If you look at the figures specifically, the GDP figures, the growth rate figures, then uh, in the last two quarters, they've not been uh, on the same lines as they were in the past uh, one, one and a half years, two years or so. And projections for the next one or two quarters is also less than 7%. So is that a cause of concern? One and two, how can that be given a push? Uh, th thanks, Vishal, um, and you're absolutely right. It is a cause of concern. Uh, the last quarter's figure of GDP declining to 5.8% is, of course, a real cause of concern. And um, we cannot uh, uh, we cannot accept a sub 7% rate of growth going forward. It has to be above 7%. In fact, our effort must be to raise this rate of growth to 9% and above, which can be done mm -hmm. and it's achievable. Now, the, the therefore the uh, and by the way, this year also, the fiscal year 1920, I pr still expect the growth to come in at about 7% plus, and which is what the RBI and the IMF, etc., have also, all, all, you know, also maintained. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason for the growth uh, declining has been the slump in private investment. That has been the principal reason. And there seems to be, as somebody put it the other day in the newspapers, a kind of drying up of animal spirits in our private investors. And I think that must be the focus of the government and that will uh, and, uh, and and of the budget, which mm -hmm. is to how to encourage the private sector, uh, how to encourage private entrepreneurs uh, to see India as a good investment opportunity. The foreigners already see it as one good uh, opportunity because this year nearly $62 billion of foreign di direct investment came into India. FDI. Um, FDI. But the domestic investor has now to get enthused, has to be facilitated and has to be promoted uh, to make investments uh, in the economy because without them, the growth rate will not rise. Okay. And the private sector is of course looking at uh, one, the ease of doing business, mm -hmm. but also on the uh, raising of demand in the economy as to whether the demand is coming up. And I think there, one major source of demand going forward could be an expansion of our exports. So I think those are the areas in which we should. Okay, so, so it's, it's quite interrelated. One, investments have to come in, exports have to grow, and that, according to you, will give that thrust uh, to the economy so that it can go beyond that 7% growth rate which we are looking for. Absolutely. Okay. No, that's, that's, that's the thought. Okay. Uh, let's, let's look at, uh, you know, one more aspect. Let's look at sector by sector now. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about uh, the agriculture sector, the rural areas, and, uh, uh, you know, a lot of concern expressed about uh, the uh, farm distress or distress in the agri sector. And looks like, you know, uh, just like the uh, uh, interim budget, which was presented just before the elections, this time around as well, uh, the focus uh, seemingly should be on agriculture and rural development as well. So what, according to you, should be or rather are going to be uh, the core thrust areas in this sector? Yeah, so the interim budget provided immediate succor. Uh, to the farmer by doing the PM Kisan Yojana, mm -hmm. which is already in place now. So we have taken care of the fact that the poorer or the smaller marginal farmer is going to be taken care of, mm -hmm. irrespective of the uh, you know outcome of the agricultural sector. And the NBIT has uh, also been increased. The NBIT has already been increased. Now I think it's important to remember two things. One that this is probably the sixth year in con in running in continuation where our monsoons have been below normal. This has never happened since independence and I think they were there, they, this is a very special challenge it poses to us. But it has shown that in the past five years, agriculture output has still been positive. Mm -hmm. And that means that agriculture has shown amazing resilience to the monsoon conditions and that's, that's very good. So that's the first point. 
but we have to take care of that because of our water situation which we will come to maybe in a later course. Mm -hmm. But the second important issue is that uh, for all that we have done in the last few decades, uh, cereal production is now growing higher at a higher rate than growth of consumption. Mm -hmm. So that there are two implications of that. One, that India is probably emerging as a surplus economy agri you know, in some agricultural sectors. Mm -hmm. And two, that there is, a, um, there is a very pressing need for agricultural diversification away from only cereal and food production, food grain production, to things like marine, uh, you know, fisheries, poultry, horticulture, floriculture, etc. Mm -hmm. But the first one, which is the surplus status, means that we now have to focus a lot on facilitating the marketing of agriculture. Okay. And there are some laws, for example, like the, uh, you know, the APMC Act, you know, or the Essential Commodities Act, which need to be reviewed because they hold back our potential for exporting agricultural commodities, which I think, and, and you would be glad to know that the Prime Minister has established a Chief Minister's, High Level Chief Minister's Committee, mm -hmm. and our Dr. Ramesh Chand, the member of Niti Aayog, is its member, on the structural transformation of agriculture, okay. which will look into all of this. So I think agriculture today needs a completely new look, as it were, then from the earlier thing which was only concentrated at raising cereal production, food grain production, for very good reason, because that is that is what gave us food security. Mm -hmm. But now we have to think about raising farmer's income. Mm -hmm. The next thing that I want to uh, about farmer's income is that the Prime Minister in the address to the you know to the parliament in you know in the reply uh, to the uh, motion, uh, of, to thanks. The motion mm -hmm. of thanks to the president uh, mentioned very clearly that we now need measures to reduce the costs of production so that farmers income can go up well yes because if the costs go up then the net you know income will go up okay. and i think there he mentioned uh, very specifically a scheme uh, called the zero budget natural farming or also now called the subhash palikar natural farming named after the uh, fa out of the founder, mm -hmm. which reduces costs in agriculture by more than 60% because it uses the, and those farmers and I am glad to tell you that more than 10 lakh farmers mm -hmm. are now practicing this in this country, uh, are practicing, they, they don't use any chemicals, mm -hmm. neither chemical fertilizer nor chemical weedicide or pesticide etc. And they also use only 30 or 40 percent of the water requirement. Okay, so that's that's quite a significant number, but that needs to be go that needs to grow further. If it we... needs to grow much further, that needs to grow pan India, mm -hmm. and that's the attempt at Niti Aayog and the Department of Min Ministry of Agriculture that we want this. We want to propagate the scheme throughout India at this point of time. Okay, and and I'm and I'm thrilled to see. The Prime Minister's support for it. Okay. Uh, when we talk about agriculture, obviously you uh, mentioned water as well, but water uh, not only with respect to agriculture, but also in terms of potable water also. And one scheme which has been talked about, which Prime Minister also mentioned, uh, was Har uh, uh, So, so water, according to you, and water conservation as well, which Prime Minister recently spoke about in his uh, first Man Ki Baat as well. So, so this is also going to be one focus area. Um, can no, no, you see something specific no, talked about in the budget? Absolutely. We brought out our water index, Niti Aayog brought out its water index in 2018 and it pointed to the fact that water situation is now an emergency, is now an emergency which cannot wait any longer mm -hmm. and it's, a, it's, it, 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 it's therefore, it, you know, it's a, to the Prime Minister's credit that the first Man Ki Baat uh, focused on that water situation, 85% of water is used in agriculture. So therefore, if we want to, uh, to if we want to address the uh, water emergency in this country, we have to tackle the problem of conservation of water and use in agriculture use. Mm -hmm. There are many ways for it, you know, there is drip irrigation or it's, uh, you know, using precision agriculture or it's using the, you know, Subhash Palikar natural farming. We have to now take that route uh, to conserve water's use in agriculture. Okay. The second point there is that we have to change our cropping pattern. There is no reason for which uh, water scarce areas like Punjab, like the Punjab should grow paddy and then they should go paddy anywhere through the flood uh, irrigation method. Now there are ways to see that you can grow paddy using about one tenth the water mm -hmm. that should be adopted. Similarly, you know, growing sugar cane and exporting sugar means basically you are exporting water because the water content is very high. So the cropping pattern has to be looked at. Okay. And the third thing is that, you know, a lot of water is 
pumped from the underground by the farmers mm -hmm. and wasted because the, 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 the electricity, the power that they use is heavily subsidized. Okay. So what we would like to do is therefore make the farmer aware of the cost of you know pumping up this water you know by for example telling him to pay the full price of electricity but then giving him a direct benefit transfer you know to be able to secure so that at least he is aware of you know what he is using and what he is doing. Okay so the subsidy will continue but it will make the farmers aware. Subsidy will continue but in a manner that it makes the farmers aware mm -hmm. and thereby hoping to reduce the it. amount of power use and hoping the amount ho hoping to reduce the amount of uh, you know water use and I, I must mention here a very good scheme now being implemented by the Punjab government mm -hmm. which is paying the government farmers uh, a good amount of money if they trans if they shift from paddy to horticulture because horticulture is much less water consuming mm -hmm. I think similar schemes now have to be thought through and finally you know all this Madhya Pradesh experience has shown that if you rejuvenate and rehabilitate your existing uh, irrigation structure, mm -hmm. the canals and the channels and so on, then the water efficiency goes up very heavily mm -hmm. and the water use uh, you know, also it, it leads to better conservation. So there is a massive uh, challenge here, we have to use all the possible measures that we can do but water challenge has to be met and as you said finally, only 18% of rural households mm -hmm. today have a water connection in their houses. We have to make sure that they get it. This was President Abdul Kalam's visit when he talked about Pura, you know, providing urban facilities in rural areas. Mm -hmm. Now you see, and, and we have to do that. And this is what the Jal Shakti program is about. Okay. And and I think we will achieve it by making it a Jan Andolan. Okay. Uh, that's that's quite significant. These two aspects, and uh, you uh, brought out uh, you know the wider scope of the things here to be done. Let's move on to the infrastructure sector now, and uh, both. Uh, uh, urban as well as rural uh, and specifically when we look at infrastructure, the speed at the rate at which highways are being built, when we look at uh, you know other core infrastructure sectors like ports, railways, water uh, you know waterways uh, and then uh, other you know support infrastructure as well. How do you see a bit more thrust? We have been uh, you know um, the, uh, the speed, the rate at which highways have been built that, that's quite significant. No it is but there are there are innumerable challenges. Uh, is still to be sorted out. One for example is the declining share of the railways in both freight freight, uh, freight movement and also now in passenger movement unfortunately mm -hmm. and you know this has to be reversed because it is ecologically far superior uh, to ship to move goods and passengers through the railways rather than on the highways and through the roads and the buses etc. Now for the first time the large government had a railway investment plan you know, 100,000 crores to be invested in five years. Now, this has to be implemented. Uh, railways have to be made the, the, the backbone of our transport movement. Similarly, you mentioned waterways already, mm -hmm. but that requires wonderful program, again ecologically far superior, much cheaper, but that requires a dredging of our rivers. That requires making the rivers more navigable. Mm -hmm. So, that's the other, you know, that's the other big issue. The third, uh, you know, the issues, uh, in our, uh, uh, you know, on the infrastructure sector, mm -hmm. is, is is of course uh, connectivity. You know, because a large number of our, uh, you know, districts are still un in con under uh, not connected mm -hmm. by airways or even by railways. Sometimes so you have to improve that so the network has to be increased. And then you see, there's a matter of technology. Uh, technology, for example, in the railways. China has 25,000 kilometers of high speed railways mm -hmm. which travel at 300 miles kilometers per hour uh, plus. Now we are building the first one now. So we you know between Ahmedabad and Mumbai and mm -hmm. I think we need to complete that in time. But then to you know expand it, expand it very rapidly. Because you can imagine that if you can reach from Delhi to Calcutta or Mumbai within 5 hours or between you know or 4 hours, the whole economic geography of this country would change. Would change. The and other, the efficiency the other, will increase. Uh, huge. Mm -hmm. The other part of the technology you see is in uh, is in is in is in digital India. You know the Bharat Net program mm -hmm. uh, needs to be uh, implemented. Now at the moment it's been very slow. Niti Aayog has been saying that we should bring in the private sector. Mm -hmm. And that brings me to the last point on the infrastructure sector. You see that the last seven eight years have seen the withdrawal of the private companies from the infrastructure sector mm -hmm. because they face a massive uh, twin balance sheet problems. So a large number of good companies uh, came uh, under huge amount of debt pressure. We have to bring the private sector back into infrastructure. 
uh, through means which minimizes their risk. Something we talked about in the initial, uh, you know, uh, point, investment, private sector. Private investment. sector investment, but I'm not specifying, if I'm talking to the infrastructure, mm -hmm. that what you have to do is to make sure that, for example, you know, let's say if you want the private sector to build a highway, mm -hmm. that the government can help them by, uh, build, you know, acquiring the land for that and then handing it over to them okay. for a particular charge. Or we have to do what is called the TOT, the Toll Operate Transfer. You know, which is that you build the road already, mm -hmm. now you can you know, lease it back for 30, 40 years to the private sector, tell them to run it, use that money to construct other roads and then hand it back over uh, to the private sector to run and manage it. Mm -hmm. Similarly, airports. You know, recently, the government announced and uh, you know, succeeded in you know, getting private sector bids for seven airports. No reason for us to run them. So they can be, you know, you know, they can be given out uh, to the private sector. Okay. The point is that without the private sector's involvement, the kind of money that you need for the infrastructure development is just simply not available. Okay. Uh, well, one aspect, uh, you know, now that you're talking about connectivity and technology, and when we talk about technology, one uh, thing on which uh, Niti Aayog has come out with several papers, uh, you know, policies in the. Uh, and recently also uh, there was uh, some uh, policy framework which was announced is about electric vehicles. Now the EV policy is something which uh, is uh, you know uh, considered as a thing of the future but then we will have to start working from here onwards. What can be the thrust uh, you know for this uh, core area, this specific area? I'm, I'm very glad that you asked this question uh, because it's such an important question in our country because you know we have missed out on many industrial revolutions even the semiconductor, the internet, we were lagging behind, you know, we are catching up all the time. Mm -hmm. This is an emerging area where countries like China have already taken a lead, but nonetheless, it's an area which is emerging all over the world. Mm -hmm. So this is one big opportunity for India to seize, uh, you know, that we can move to electric and connected mobility. Vishal, the problem is that we cannot follow the American model of transport, mm -hmm. which is private car ownership. You know, they have about 800 cars per thousand population. We can't afford to do that because simply the ecology will not permit us. So we have to shift to to ecologically friendly transport mechanism, which is offered by the electric mobility. Now, Niti Aayog has been at the forefront of it. We organized a, a conference called Move on Electric Mobility in October 2018. The Prime mm -hmm. Minister kindly inaugurated it. The entire industry was there. And since then, we have been trying to push the agenda forward. Now, two or three things here. One, we have been continuously consulting with the with the industry okay. as to what should we do, how should it be done, you know, what is the way forward. Second, we are clear in our mind that unless we have a clear time frame, unless we have some targets, you cannot have a clear policy and therefore you cannot have investment coming into this industry. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a plan for transition. Okay. And third, we are know that there is a whole ecosystem to be built around it, which includes, uh, you know, making batteries, batteries you know, the storage right. batteries, the lithium ion batteries, hopefully next few years. Providing also, charging station infrastructure. Charging structure, structure on the highways. Now, today you must have read in the newspapers that the government has asked all the gas station petrol pumps, 60,000 of them, to have a charging you know, point there. So we are trying to do that. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and the third is that we need to have these very big uh, lithium ion batteries to be produced uh, within the country. So the Niti Aayog is clear mm -hmm. uh, that we want to do this. We are in consulting with the, uh, with, the, with the industry. And what we've thought is that the first step in this direction okay. is that by 2023, there should be no more three-wheelers mm -hmm. which are run on petrol or diesel okay. or gas. And that by 2025, there should not be any new two-wheelers which are not electric, Will electric not charge. Okay. Now, we want to set a date because without a date, you will not get the expansion that you desire. Any and dates are set for four wheelers as well? Not yet, mm -hmm. but we are trying to do that. And you know, and and but but the, but the point is simply that we would like the industry uh, to give us themselves a time frame mm -hmm. according to which they think they can make the transition. But they also tell me that the transition to electric mobility is in the national interest. So that is what we should do. Okay, uh, let's uh, now move it, uh, you know, uh, another aspect uh, and uh, let's move to social areas, uh, but specific important areas as well. Education, health, these are two core sectors and time and again when we talk about health, it has been, uh, you know, said that uh, India needs to spend more in terms of, uh, 
you know, the percentage of GDP on health specifically and education as well. So how do you think that spending can be increased and the corresponding results can also be achieved? Yeah. So um, there is a very clear case of the government spending from 1.5 to 3, raising its expenditure to 3% of the GDP mm -hmm. uh, and same thing with the you know, basic education and you know, and so on that we need to do that. Uh -huh. But the, the issue here really is that we want to make sure that this money is well spent. Because you can't just keep pouring money, you know, the good money behind bad money and not seeing the results. Because this is what has happened in our country. Unfortunately, uh -huh. this is what has happened. So what we are trying to do here is that, you know, in our Niti Aayog, uh, there is a uh, attached office called the Development Monitoring and Evaluation Office, the DMEO. And the DMEO is now uh, preparing what is called an output outcome framework for all the ministries. And I'm very glad to say that uh, this time uh, the, the, the Ministry of Finance has agreed that this output outcome framework will be presented along with the budget. Okay. So that henceforth all the ministries, and we are doing it you know, to begin with only for 162 uh, main com uh, schemes, uh -huh. but which do account for 95% of government expenditure. And we are saying that all these schemes, we now need to know what your targets are and we now need to know also whether those targets are being achieved or not. Okay. Targets for output and outcome. Uh -huh. I think this is a this is a massive change. This is an absolutely huge change that is in the making. And once it is implemented phase by phase, step by step, you will see an improvement of, of a, the order of magnitude mm -hmm. in the working of the government and in the working of these two social sectors. Okay. Uh, when we spoke about, you know, uh, the uh, macroeconomic picture and we spoke about investment, how exports are to go up and all that, uh, one related aspect is the banking sector. And there's been a lot of talk about how the banking sector needs, uh, you know, a bit of a push in terms of reforms, in terms of more money to be put in. So how do you see, you know, uh, will, will, will we see uh, some sort of indication in this uh, budget, the first budget of uh, this government uh, as to how it wants to go ahead as far as banking sector is concerned? Uh, you must also remember that the government inherited a very poor banking sector situation. You know, we had eight and a half lakh crore of NPAs. The banking se sector lending to industry had declined continuously from 2011 in the growth of that and into some sectors like exports uh, it had become even negative you know, so which meant that the uh, that uh, exports could not you know take off at all mm -hmm. uh, so so we have inherited that bad situation we worked hard we have recapitalized the banks to the extent of 2 lakh crores mm -hmm. in the past few years and you will undoubtedly see uh, not just some indication, but a major thrust okay. on how to improve the banking sector performance in the coming budget. Okay, lastly, uh, you know, and uh, this is something which uh, would uh, many people uh, in that middle class segment would be interested in. That's about uh, taxation. You know, if you look at uh, uh, income tax, that's static tax, or uh, even uh, from the uh, company's point of view, the corporate tax, there, have been, there has been a, you know, a constant demand from the corporates to go ahead and bring that down. I know there's been a committee which has been put in, uh, you know, constituted, it will submit its report in terms of uh, how to uh, bring it a direct tax code. But do you see anything, uh, be, you know, else uh, in addition to what was uh, mentioned in the interim budget as far as uh, uh, these direct taxes are concerned? Well, I mean, it's not, um, uh, you know, you first of all, you talked about the corporate sector, you mm -hmm. see, and corporate tax, and you must, uh, I'm sure you know that 95% of the companies in India have now been brought under 25% uh, to, to corporate tax rate. So that's a big, huge change that we've done. Only 5% now pay 34 point something uh, corporate tax rate. Okay. And there, so there is, there is a conversation on how to further simplify, simplify. Uh, this, this tax structure. And uh, also to uh, uh, try and give some fiscal boost to the real estate sector. Because mm -hmm. that is where I talked, if you remember, I talked in the beginning about creating demand. And I think the best demand that you can create mm -hmm. is in the real estate and housing sector. And, if, for ex and just as an example, you know, at the moment you are allowed to deduct 2 lakhs of rupees as an interest that you pay on housing loans mm -hmm. from your expenditure. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can count it as expenditure. You know, I might think that if you raise it to, you know, from 2 to 4 lakhs, 
uh, that will be quite uh, useful. Mm -hmm. Earlier there was a provision that if you bought a second house, you could also take that deduction you know, from the uh, you know the interest rate that has been taken back, that could be taken, you know, brought back. Okay. So some things like that would be done to boost the demand in the economy uh, and in the sectors which have a large number of backward linkages. Okay, one final question and that is about, you know, uh, that uh, five trillion dollar economy goal which has been set. Now, do you think some specific steps which will begin from this budget onwards so that that goal is achieved any time frame or if not then the way we have to go ahead as far as that uh, you know achieving that particular goal. The most right? important thing here is to remember and know that this is not an unachievable target mm -hmm. as many people have said. India should and must and will achieve the uh, 5 trillion dollar economy in the, in the next few years as we go along and all that we've talked about uh, in terms of encouraging private investment, in terms of expanding exports, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of you know bringing in the infrastructure that you need, or you know doing the railways, giving a boost, all of that will go towards realizing our uh, realizing our target of making India a five trillion dollar economy. Okay, okay. So thank you so much uh, for your time. Thank you. So this was uh, Niti Aayog's Vice Chairman Rajiv Kumar on what uh, the government might do as far as the core sectors, the thrust areas are concerned in its first budget in the second term. Of course, we'll have to wait and watch for the Finance Minister Nirmala Sitharaman to start her budget speech on Friday at 11 a.m. and we'll know exactly what lies in that budget for 2019. Keep watching Rajasabha Television.